Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to First Baptist Church this morning. We're so glad to be in the house of the Lord worshiping together today. I invite you to take your bulletins if you receive them by email and just have a look through them. Um, the first thing I wanted to do was to announce congratulations to Ronald and Fairlyn Pillay on the birth of their baby girl, Riley. So that's exciting. She was born last Thursday, a week ago Thursday, and uh, she weighed 7 pounds, 14 ounces. So uh, We're happy to have good news and uh, the news of birth and new life to add to our <laughs> lives these days, aren't we? Um, there aren't too many announcements in your bulletins, but just uh, do take note of the COVID precautions that we have to be following. Uh, thank you all for following them so far, and um, they have been extended until the end of January. So continue to let me know if you're coming to church. That's a real big help for us to make sure we keep our numbers around 30. Uh, so you can either call the office or email me or just get a hold of us somehow and we'll put you down. So thank you so much for doing that. And uh, if you do need to use the washroom, just go down out this door and down the stairs and right to the bottom and either of the two men's washrooms there you are there for your use. And that is all I had for announcements today. So our call to worship. Come, let's praise God together. Blessed are we who place our trust in the Lord our God. For our God is the maker of heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything that lives in them. Our God keeps every promise and remains faithful forever. Our God gives justice to those who are oppressed and food to the starving. Our God frees the prisoners, opens the eyes of the blind, and lifts the burden of those who are overwhelmed. Our God cherishes those who do what is right, protects the immigrants, cares for the orphans and the widows, but frustrates the plans of the wicked. Our God reigns today, tomorrow, and forever. Praise God. Would you bow with me in prayer as we open our service this morning? We praise you, O oh God, for being not only the God of history, but the God of our story. You have gathered us here today to remind us that although you are the one to whom all power belongs, yet you care for the weak and the powerless, and you care for us. We praise you for joining your story to ours in such a special way through Jesus our Lord. He proved his great love for you, and for each person in the way he lived, releasing what was captive, lifting up the burdened, empowering the powerless. God, source of loving kindness and strength, we worship you. Jesus, foundation of our faith, we worship you. Holy Spirit, ground of our very being, we worship you. Amen. Our first hymn this morning is When Morning Gilds the Skies. I'm going to invite you to stand if you feel like you would like to stand for this one. Uh, but just remember, we can't sing because of COVID restrictions, but do uh, you can take up the words in your heart as Chris sings for us. So stand for uh, When Morning Gilds the Skies. When morning gilds the skies, my heart be praised. I like at work or prayer. To Jesus I repair. May Jesus Christ be praised. The sadness fill my mind. A solace here I find. May Jesus Christ be for faith, my earthly bliss, my comfort still is this. May Jesus Christ be praised. The night becomes as day when from the heart we say, May Jesus Christ be praised in heaven. The loveliest strain is this. May Jesus Christ be praised. He lives while life is mine. My canticle divine. May Jesus Christ be praised. See this eternal song through all the Be 
can be seated. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is the Lord their God. For he is the maker of the heaven and the earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. He gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord our God reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. And our gospel reading for this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 14 through 30. Jesus returned to Galilee and the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it to, back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, Do here in your hometown what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, Prophets are not accepted in their hometowns. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel at, in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy at the time of Elisha the prophet, and yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. All right, I brought props again for our children's story. Can I make this big enough for me to get through it? Yeah? Rachel believes in me. <laughs> All right. It takes a little maneuvering, but I can do it. So, just so you know, I'm not tricking you. I'll do it in front of you, too. All right. So while I'm doing this, our Bible story had some people in it. There was a widow from a place called Zarephath, which was outside of Israel. And there was a man named Naaman, who's a Syrian. So a Syrian means he wasn't from the people of Israel. And uh, Jesus said they were pretty special to God. And in fact, God allowed them to join his family, even though they were kind of considered outsiders. And not just outsiders, they were even kind of considered enemies. Because the widow from Zarephath, she lived in, she came from the same place as Queen Jezebel, and Jezebel's not a very good person in the story that she's in. And Naaman the Syrian was the commander of an army that actually beat the Israelites. And then he goes to Elisha and gets healed somehow. And they join the family of God. So I thought that was an interesting thing that happened in our story. Okay. So keep those things in your mind. 
as I work on this here. Okay, can I do it? Yeah, I don't read it right. So. Oops, I'm gonna rip it. I have to start over again. We don't want that. <laughs> you can join me for craft time with Mandy sometime. Let's see how that goes. All right, I'm almost done. I'm almost there. Okay, so there we go. So I've stretched this paper out. Do you think I can get through it? Well, let's do it this way. Then I won't touch it on my desk. Look at that. I made one piece of paper big enough that I could fit through it. Ta -da! Well, the reason I went through all that length <laughs> to demonstrate that to you is because I was thinking about the people I was talking about. I was thinking of Naaman and the widow of Zarephath. We don't know her name. And it's kind of amazing that they got to join the family of God because, as I said, they were considered enemies of the people of Israel. And yet God made a way for him to join their family, his family. And I believe that when Jesus came to earth, he made it a way for all of us to join his family. And I thought that was really neat. So that's what I was thinking today. Sometimes you think there's no way, but there's a way. Would you bow with me in prayer? Dear God, we thank you that you made a way for us to become a part of your family through Jesus Christ. Amen. Our next song that we're going to hear is In Christ Alone. Once again, if you feel comfortable and wish, I invite you to stand for this. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, Look on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe. This gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save. Till on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin. On him was laid, here in the death of Christ I live. There in the ground his body laid, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me, for I am his and he is mine, bought with the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me. Life first try to final breath. Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can never pluck me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ. I'll stand.
Thank you. You can be seated. Well, when you're listening to a teaching or a phrase, where you put the emphasis in that teaching or a phrase often matters. Just for fun, I invite you to consider this sentence. I never said he stole my money. Every time you emphasize a different word in that sentence, it changes the meaning of the sentence. I never said he stole my money sounds different and means different than I never said he stole my money. It's a fun little game, and now I realize you're all going to be doing it while I'm preaching, so maybe save it for the way home if you could. (laughs) But so it is in Luke chapter 4, Jesus' very first sermon that he gives. And the very first sermon Jesus gives invites you to think of the focus and the outline that Jesus would like you to put on the ministry that begins to unfold. And I do say the word unfold intentionally because as we see, although things are just still getting started in this story, Jesus has already been doing ministry, even if it's not recorded. Jesus is already beginning to get noticed. He's developing a reputation As it says at the very beginning of our reading, a report about him spread throughout the surrounding country and he began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. So when Jesus returns to Nazareth, which is his hometown, and he goes to the synagogue, when he walks in, they hand him the scroll so that he can read from it. But that's not an honor they give to just anybody who comes into the synagogue. You have to be special already to be able to do that. And Jesus selected a passage from Isaiah about bringing good news to the poor, a message of release to the captives and the oppressed, recovery of sight for the blind, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor or welcome. And then Jesus hands the scroll back to the attendant and says, today this message has been fulfilled in your hearing. But depending on where you put the emphasis, it can change how you hear what Jesus has to say. So we're going to begin today by looking at what it says to us if we put the emphasis on the word today. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we actually looked at this passage with our Thursday night devotional group, and someone brought up a really excellent question. This is the way you should read your Bible, folks. Just a couple of verses on, Jesus says, Doubtless you will say to me, Do also hear in your hometown the things that we heard you did at Capernaum. And the person's question was, Well, what did Jesus do at Capernaum? Wonderful question. And so when I was preparing this message, I read the beginning of Luke over again to see what Jesus did in Capernaum, according to Luke. And the answer is, Jesus hasn't even been to Capernaum, at least as far as Luke tells us, when this story happens. It's the very next thing he does, actually. Right after this happens, he goes to Capernaum. Now, as I already mentioned, Jesus has been at work. He's been doing ministry. He's already developed a reputation and beginning to get noticed by the time he walks into the synagogue. So sure, he was probably at Capernaum. But Luke doesn't say what he did there. You have to read forward in the book to figure out what Jesus does at Capernaum, not backward. And in fact, I think that's true of everything Jesus says in this passage. Because we know that during Jesus' lifetime, during Jesus' ministry, Jesus does, in fact, speak good news. He does, in fact, heal blind people so that they receive their sight. But none of that has happened yet. Not in Luke's telling of the story anyway. All the stuff that comes to characterize Jesus' ministry comes in the future. So what does it mean when Jesus says then, today this message has been fulfilled in your hearing? Well, I think we often, and you guys probably know this, when we think about yesterday, we tend to hold it up and we look at it with a bit of rose-colored glasses, don't we? Sometimes we think there's sometime in the past were our glory days, and we believe in our minds that things were so much better then than they are now, whether they were or not. And tomorrow, we also tend to fetishize tomorrow a little bit, believing that things are going to get so much better tomorrow. Tomorrow is unwritten, Tomorrow is full of possibility. But Jesus in this passage doesn't say, tomorrow these things are going to be fulfilled, or they were fulfilled sometime in the past. Today, he says. And today is so ordinary. Today has none of that rose-colored glow that we look on with the past. It has none of the starry-eyed wonder and wishing of tomorrow. Because today we are clear-eyed. Today, we know all of our faults and failings and all the pains we woke up with this morning. 
and we're realistic about the way the world is right now. So what does it mean when Jesus says today this message will be is fulfilled? Not in the future when Jesus will have done all of the things that he promised. Not when he's proven his prowess with a few miracles or walked on water or delighted the crowds by taking on religious leaders in debates. Or even later when Jesus is resurrected from the dead or the Holy Spirit has been poured out on the early church. But today, he says, does it change anything for us to remember that God is with us today? And that we're not waiting until we are our ideal selves or until we paid off the debt or lost the weight or cleaned out our closet or finally gotten organized or kept all of our New Year's resolutions for God to be with us. What does it mean to remember that God is with us today and God promises to be with us today, not when we get the vaccine for COVID in our arms or when all the restrictions are lifted or the day we have that glorious celebration when we can hug each other once again, but today, that whatever we're going through right now and today, that God is still with us now. How does emphasizing today change the view of the message that Jesus is proclaiming? Because today, Jesus says, this passage has been fulfilled in your hearing. So that's one emphasis that might help us to understand what's going on here. Another part that I wanted to think about briefly is what happens if we emphasize the role of the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is actually one aspect to Luke's story that's pretty unique to the way he tells Jesus' story. We're in Luke chapter 4, and Jesus has been baptized, and the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus as a dove in Luke chapter 3, but Luke chapter 4 begins like this. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, where he was baptized, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was tempted for 40 days. So that's two mentions already right there of the Spirit in uh, chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. And then after the ordeal in the desert, Luke says, then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee. That's where our reading today started. And then once again, Jesus picks up the scroll that he's handed in the synagogue, and he turns straight to the part where it is written, the Holy Spirit is upon me because he has anointed me. So that's already four mentions in Luke chapter 4 of the Holy Spirit. And I don't want to give away the ending, but you may or may not know that the book of Acts is actually Luke volume 2. So the same writer wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. And the book of Acts begins when the Holy Spirit is poured out on all the believers at Pentecost after Jesus is taken up to heaven. And that book goes on to detail how the Spirit worked in the life of those believers and directed the work of the early church. That book's full name is The Acts of the Apostles, but I've heard it said more than once that you could probably actually call that book The Acts of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the source of Jesus' power all throughout his ministry, and Luke really emphasizes that in the way he tells the story of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is also the uh, power that empowers the early church to go into all the world and preach the good news to all nations. And the really good news is that the same Holy Spirit who came on Jesus and who came on those early believers is the same Spirit that is alive and active today. It's the same Spirit that lives and works in you. But here's one thing one writer has to say about the work of the Holy Spirit. He says, power at least the power of the Holy Spirit, the power that is of God, is not demonstrated by accomplishments or attributes that we claim for our own selves, but only through what the Spirit accomplishes for others. Power is only power when it sets others free, only when it builds up others, only when used for the betterment of those around you. So you too have the power of the Holy Spirit, but that power is for the benefit of the people around you, It's a power that enables you to serve each other, to lift each other up, rather than gain accomplishments or achievements or plaudits that you put beside your own name. The Holy Spirit operates in the background, but Luke takes pains to emphasize the work of God's Spirit both in Jesus' life, the life of the early church, and in our lives. And it matters where you put the emphasis. And our last exercise and emphasis this morning. 
One writer points out that a really good way to sum up the entire work of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke is this. Jesus' message and ministry is this. God came to redeem everyone. But how you understand that sentence, once again, depends on where you put the emphasis. Because halfway through our story, you might have noticed it when we read it, there's a really abrupt shift in the way the crowds respond to Jesus. When the story begins and Jesus speaks to the crowd and he reads the words from the scroll of Isaiah to them and he says to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing, the crowd is utterly delighted. God came to redeem everyone. They're thrilled and excited. And not just one or two of them, but everyone there that day, according to the story. Here's what we read. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? So Jesus is talking about freedom and good news and healing and redemption. And this hometown crowd is totally on board with what Jesus is talking about. And they're speaking well of him. This hometown boy is a hero. The newest celebrity that everyone is talking about is the real deal. Crown him with many crowns. They understand why everyone is still talking about Jesus and they want to get involved. Or at least they want to reserve a front row seat. God came to redeem everyone, and that's good news. But then, Jesus keeps talking. I don't know why he doesn't quit while he's ahead here, but he doesn't. He keeps talking, and the crowd shifts very suddenly. In this story, we almost get the kind of whiplash that you get near the end of the gospel, when Jesus rides into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey and is greeted by enthusiastic crowds crying out, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. And then by the end of that very same week, the crowd, with loud shouts, insistently demanded that he be crucified, and their shouts prevailed. I imagine what happened in Capernaum, or in Nazareth, excuse me, a little like this. We too are struggling against our own restrictions and loss of freedom as we continue to ride out this pandemic. But we have hope on the horizon, and not actually just on the horizon. It's a reality. It's today. We have a vaccine. In fact, we have multiple vaccines, and there are literal doses of those vaccines manufactured and being delivered. And some people in our great province have already received the vaccine. So our freedom has come close. It's near. But then even though we know that there is a vaccine manufactured, ready to go, and our hopes are high and our spirits are ready to soar, we begin to get news that other people might get the vaccine first. And not just people we respect and admire, like doctors and nurses and other frontline workers, but some people we're not sure should get the vaccine before us. The vaccine is good news, yes, but it is good news for everyone. And we might not be first in line. And just like that, that might change how we think about the vaccine program. In fact, I think that's very close to what happened in Jesus' hometown synagogue that day early in his ministry, because they are so excited to hear the good news and to uh, hear more about what Jesus has to say about redemption and release and healing and wholeness that Jesus has come to bring. But then all of a sudden, Jesus puts the emphasis on the second half of his declaration. God came to redeem everyone. And Jesus says this, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there are many in Israel with leprosy at the time of Elisha the prophet, and not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. So Jesus retells them the old, old story that being the good synagogue goers that they are, they have undoubtedly heard before. Only he emphasizes that little point that's always there in Scripture, right from the beginning of God's work in the world. In Genesis chapter 12, when God taps Abraham on the shoulder, and tells him to go where God is going to send him. God adds this, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. So the salvation that God promises Abraham by the end of the story is supposed to embrace all of humankind. 
God has always had the entire world in view, even when God focused on that one particular family and that one particular people. And Jesus reinforces this, and he puts the emphasis on the part of the story as he preaches to the hometown crowd. And as we discussed a little bit earlier, the widow who lived in Zarephath lived in the hometown of Jezebel, who is not a good person in the story. So she could have been considered to be living in the land of the enemy, and yet that's where Elijah is sent. And not only does Elijah get fed in that story, but so does this widow, and so does her son. And Naaman, the Syrian, was a great commander of the army, but not the army of Israel, the army of Aram. And he had gained great favor in his master's sight because he'd beaten the Israelites. But the commander of the army that opposed Israel and won goes to see Elisha because of his leprosy, and Elisha heals him. Now, by the end of both of those stories, both the widow of Zarephath and Naaman come to believe that Israel's God is the one true God. But the point that Jesus was making was more that those outsiders were incorporated into God's family. Because that's how God works. That's how God has always worked all throughout history, not just on behalf of a select few insiders, but on behalf of the entire world. And not only on the behalf of the entire world, but on behalf of people that we formerly considered our enemies. As one writer puts it, Israel's God is always rescuing the wrong people, and Jesus intended to follow suit. So God came to redeem everyone, and when Jesus puts the emphasis on the redeem, it is good news, and the crowd eats it up, and all speak well of him. But then when Jesus changes the emphasis to everyone, that's when things get dicey. Preacher Fred Craddock puts it this way, Jesus does not go elsewhere because he is rejected. He is rejected because he goes elsewhere. And the hometown crowd that has held Jesus in such high esteem are suddenly filled with rage. And they got up and drove him to the edge of town and they led him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built so they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. So it wasn't Jesus' day to be sacrificed, but the crowd was so angry, they are murderous. The hometown crowd cannot keep Jesus to themselves. They cannot expect preferential treatment just because they knew Jesus when he was a kid, and they are enraged by that. So Jesus shows up in Nazareth, his hometown, with good news that is good news for today. More than that, the presence of Jesus in this world is the good news God came to redeem everyone. And the question we need to ask as we hear this good news is where do we want to put the emphasis? Would you bow with me in prayer? God of the nations, you sent your son to earth with the good news that you came to redeem everyone. Show us how to love all the people of the earth, of all colors and kinds, those who have technology and those who don't, those who make do with very little and those who have many resources to use, those with formal education and those without, those who call upon your name and those who do not yet, so that all may become your children and all may be glorified in the name of the one who brought glory and liberty, Jesus Christ, our salvation. Amen. I invite you to take a moment of silent reflection and meditation. Our next hymn is Christ for the World We Sing. 
again if you wish uh, and are able, I invite you to stand for this hymn. Thank you. You can be seated. We're moving now to our time of prayer, so I invite you to bow with me for the praise of God's people. Heavenly Father, as we come to you in prayer today, we ask that you would bring stillness to our hearts, that you would empty our minds of other things, and direct our thoughts to those especially who need our prayers today. When we reflect on how you have supported and cared for us in the past, we cannot fail to give you thanks when we consider the way that you give us courage and help us for each new day, we are filled with a sense of gratitude and praise. When you lift us from the pit of doubt and despair, our whole being feels renewed and refreshed. What a comfort it is to know the love and support that you bring us through your Son and by your Spirit. In our joy at our own comfort, let us not forget those who know little else but sadness. As we express our gratitude and praise, we also do not forget those whose lives are filled with regret and heartbreak. In our feelings of support and guidance, we also do not wish to forget those who feel that they have struggled against life's difficulties and disappointments and felt alone and uncared for. In our desire to give you praise, do not blur our vision of the hardship of this life, the despair of the homeless in inner cities, the feelings of guilt by parents, who cannot feed their children, or who struggle with online schooling, the worries and, and fears of those who are sick and in the hospital. God, we especially lift before you those who are struggling with the coronavirus and those who work against it. Lord, we think of the isolation of the lonely, the exhaustion of medical professionals and frontline and essential workers, of teachers and children and parents and leaders and decision makers. God, we do not forget this deep sense of loss for those who are bereaved and who are struggling with grief. Heavenly Father, you are not only God of this world, you are also the ruler of your heavenly kingdom. Strengthen us while we live out our life on this earth. Show us the compassion and caring of Jesus. Hold before us the reality of your kingdom where there is no suffering, pain, or regret, so that we may share this with those who are without hope because we ask for all these things through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our final song this morning is Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Once again, this is a great one to stand for. I invite you to stand. Oh, for a thousand tongues. 
loves to sing my great Redeemer's praise. The glories of my God and King, the triumphs of his grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name. Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrows cease, tis music in the sinner's ears, tis life and health and peace. He breaks the power of canceled sin, he sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest clean, his blood avails for me. Glory to God and praise and love be ever, ever given by saints below and saints above, the church in earth and heaven. As we leave this place of worship today, we know that much of the road ahead is uncertain and the path is constantly changing. But we also know that some things are as sure and solid as the ground beneath our feet and the sky above our heads. We know God is love. We know Christ's light endures. We know the Holy Spirit is there, found in the space between all things and closer to us than our next breath, binding us together until we meet again. Until we do, Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen.